Hallelujah. Well, this morning I'm going to talk about honor. Everyone say honor. Honor. I'm going to use a couple extra um, sources today. This, I, read a, I read a great uh, article written by, you like this guy, Pastor Ote. Yeah. I think he's really the buckwheat. But Ote, O-T-E-Y is his name. And a lot of the stuff this morning, the, the list and stuff of understanding parts of the Ten Commandments is taken uh, from, from his, uh, his article on the Ten Commandments. I just thought uh, I want to put that out right there. So if you think I'm copying somebody's message, only a portion of his, okay? Just want to let you know. But I, I think that Ote, Ote, you know me. But this morning, I want to talk to you about honor, and, and I'm going to deal with three of the Ten Commandments that we, we, come on, if we want to be honest, these are the ones that we see abused the most. Number one, the, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and Exodus 20, verses 12 through 14, and here's what it says. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. Those are the big ones, right? Yeah. Well, this morning I went to the Amplified Bible, and here's what it says. Honor, which means respect, obey, care for mm -hmm. your father and your mother, so that your days may be prolonged in the land of the Lord your God gives you. I think that really is key with what my parents brought me to say to me. I brought you this world. I'll take you out of it, right? Yeah. And, and so... I'm going to share a little bit about this week with my parents. It should be fun with honoring. Um, verse 13 in, in the Amplified, it says, You shall not commit murder, unjustified, deliberate homicide. Amplified uses the word homicide. I think that's pretty cool. And of course, nobody can miss, even add anything else to understand what number 14 says. It says, You shall not commit adultery. And if you look at Matthew 5, 27, 28, not only adultery is forbidden, but also any act of sexual impurity or unchastity or any form of pornography or any other obscenity. Matthew 5. So as we deal with this, we should be all excited and stoked and come away going, oh, I get it. I get it. You might want to turn this mic down just a tad because that might wake everybody up. Listen to this passage of scripture that comes up next. I believe it, there we go, Ephesians, I knew it was Ephesians. Paul the Apostle, no, verse 6, uh, maybe I gave the wrong one. Here's it's in Ephesians, it was 6, Ephesians 6, okay, Ephesians 6, here's what it says. Ephesians 6, 2 through 4, says this, you ready for this? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, which with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Mm -hmm. And your fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We ask that you speak to us, that you challenge us, that you even pierce our very heart with your word. Yes. Lord, we want to learn about honor today. Mm -hmm. And Lord God, we'll just saturate ourselves in you. Teach us, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. 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 Honor. This Monday morning, my parents got, got here Sunday afternoon. Monday morning, I woke up getting ready to go to Lifeguard at the rec center. And sitting in front of my TV was all my parents' luggage. They were going to leave. I was mad. I was like, for real? You drove two days to see me for 12 hours. I mean, I should be the most important thing in your life, right? At least that's what I was thinking. So before I said anything, do you know what the word bite your tongue? That actually needs to happen, you know. And the tongue, and the Bible says the tongue is a terrible thing to train. Well, so I walked into my kitchen. I made my protein shake because I had to leave in a few minutes. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say goodbye to my parents in the morning going to the rec center. I was so mad. So I'm sitting at the lifeguard Stand up like, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? And all of a sudden, the Lord reminded me what I was preaching about this morning. <laughs> Honor your father and mother, for your days will go long. Okay. So I'm praying. So I text Carrie. I says, my parents plan to leave today. And 
and, and, and I, I can't see my mom driving another 24 hours by herself because she did most of the driving here, exhausted. So if I con them in to stay until Wednesday, I'm going to drive them home and I'll fly back on Friday. See, honoring the mother and father thing, it does, this doesn't stop like saying, I thank you, mom and dad. Sometimes it goes into action. Yes. Amen? So when I begin to think about that, that was very difficult for me because I didn't have the money to get a plane ticket. Um, so here's what happened. My, my dad is stubborn. You think where I got that from. But my dad is very stubborn. We got him go to the emergency room on, on Monday. And he got all drugged up, got all like three different new drugs. And with, by Wednesday, I mean, they were still planning to leave Wednesday morning without me. And all of a sudden, my dad woke up on Tuesday, and I was, I was still kind of mad because in the evening, he goes, well, I think we're going to leave in the morning. And I, I didn't say nothing, bit my tongue again. And, and I was like, okay. And then he says, Tim, I'm really sorry I made you mad. I said, Dad, because you're so stubborn, you're going to do whatever you want to do. Didn't say anything more than that. Wednesday, later that evening on Tuesday, my dad says, well, I think we're going we're gonna to push it out till Friday. I was like, yes, I don't have to leave my family for Thanksgiving. I don't have to fly home, even though I like to fly, and, but my parents are staying for a little time. Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, my brother shows up, and, and some of you got to meet my brother. Are we not alike? We're, there's nothing the same about us. We're different. He, he is a Harley rider. He is, you know. Anyway, so he came, and I wanted our family because we've not been together for a long time, so it was really great. But honor your parents. In Exodus 21, 15 and 17, it says, He that smitteth, yeah, like this King James for you, his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. If that happened in this day and age, we'd have a lot of dead teenagers. <laughs> and he that curseth his father or his mother sh shall surely be put to death. This day and age... I was a teenager a long, long time ago, and it's not only teenagers, it's adult children that disrespect their parents. Mm -hmm. And so the fact is that if we took this seriously, that if you dishonored your parents, you'd be put to death, we'd have a lot less disrespect of our parents. Uh -huh. Amen? So let's talk about this a little bit further. The principle, everyone's like, all the parents, you know, you guys are looking at teenagers now, I know, you're like, oh, wait till we get home, we know. <laughs> I, I did that the other day. Well, Don't worry. <laughs> He's going to buy you lunch today. That's what's yeah. up. What is, what is the principle? It, the principle comes down to this. It is that we need to obey them. My parents, my mom's 73, my dad's 77, and I still obey them. And they will, well, they will make sure I obey them. For a long time, I didn't change my air filter in my van. And my dad would call me every time we talk. Did you change your air filter yet? Did you change your air filter? You need to change your air filter. Did you change your air filter? Finally, I said, Dad, I finally changed my air filter. But even, even as adults, we need to respect our parents. Now, the other side of things, what if we had really terrible parents that abused us, that, that did wrong to us? In that matter, we need to do our very best to respect them. Because there is parents that are not very good parents. I've met several of them. And in that midst, that how do you still respect those parents that are just nasty? They're not very, they, they don't even deserve respect. The Bible says that if you respect your parents, if you honor your parents, it will go well with you, right? And so the fact is, when you begin to obey your parents, even when they're not respectable, you hear me, if you and yourself will respect your parents, you don't have to... Google -goo and gaga over your parents. Because the fact is, there's some parents that don't even deserve respect. I, I tell you the straight up truth that there are some parents, but it says in the Bible that we're supposed to honor our mother and father. Maya, my brother, for the longest time had dissension against my mom. But every Christmas, my brother would give my mom a gift. They didn't have a good relationship. Every Christmas, every birthday, or whatever, would do that. And, and the fact is, he was still honoring, though they didn't get along. Mm -hmm. He was doing his very best that he could. And sometimes it's very difficult to do that when you have not very nice parents. Then the other side is not having nice, very nice kids. 
Amen? So in Luke 2.51, I think it's up there, it says this, Then he came and went with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Jesus set the example for us for the first 30 years of his life was subject unto his earthly parents. Our young people need to learn that this is, is for their own good and happiness. We, we were laughing at the dinner table that my dad, my kid asked my dad if he still had the special belt that he used to beat us with. And he doesn't. That's good. But he used, to, he used to discipline us. The Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child, right? Something like that, right? I, you know, there's a problem. We, we, get the, we get an issue that we shouldn't spank our kids. I come on. My kids got whoopings. And I told my kids, I said, I don't care if you're a teenager, I still whoop your honey. You know? The fact is, you have to train up a child in the way they should go. You're not abusing your child to give them a swat. I, I, uh, I was in Florida, and Gloriana, they're not in here, they're doing children. Gloriana was dis, dis, misbehaving at the flea market. And, and, I mean, she was screaming. I mean, there's, oh, you know, crazy kid. And my mom, love my mom, she turned around and she says, you know, it is legal in Florida to spank your child. <laughs> and I went, oh yeah. I says, Glory, come with me. <laughs> so I threw over my shoulder like a sack of potatoes. We went to the minivan. She, ah! It's like I was abusing her and she wasn't being abused. Trust me. And when I closed the door, she was, <laughs> this is one swat and a hug. We had this thing that you could have it the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is you bend over my lap and I give you a swat. I give you a hug. I tell you I love you. We move on. The hard way is if I have to grab your hand and pull you to my lap, you're going to get a whooping. You have to obey him. Obey, obey your parents. Parents, most of the time, know what's best. Most of the time. I know that for my kids, my wife is a better parent than I am most of the time, but um, I don't always give my, parent, my kids great counsel, but I try. My wife is a better parent, but we decided when we got married that we would not do parenting the same way as our parents did. We just decided because we are come from, she comes from down home country, I come from city folk. And they mesh together, and you know down home country and city folk, we have so many discipline, different styles of discipline. You know, come on, it, it's crazy. When country folk go out and shovel manure, city folk, you're going to get a whip by a special bell. It, it's, it's the idea, but parents want the very best for their children, amen? Yes. You want them to grow up uh, doing well. In fact, my, parent, my dad, when I first, and I'm going to use my parents in this section quite a bit, when I was, I went to Bible college, and my dad told me, maybe you need to continue on to school and get, get something to fall back on when you go into ministry because the ministry doesn't work out for you. And I said, Dad, I'm not doing that. His whole concept was that if I wasn't making enough money as a pastor, I needed something to fall back on. I can tell you the truth that I told my dad I wasn't going to do that, but because God has always provided for us. The fact is, he was trying to work out what's best for me. Yeah. Amen? And your parents hopefully do that. We also need to understand that we need to love our parents. Amen? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Let's pray right here. I know that some of you, your parents have passed away. But I know that most, some of you also actually go back to their, their cemetery plots and put, put uh, flowers at their cemetery every, every year. And, and it's honoring but if your parents are alive, think about the last time you told them that you loved them. Those words, I love you, means a lot. Yes. Now the parents, you parents, you don't get off so easy. The kids have to say I love you and I respect you and all that stuff. But the parent, you parents, even, even with adult kids, it says in the Bible, fathers, provoke your, not your children to wrath. 
We must love our kids. We not, must not get them so amped up like my parents do to me. They make me crazy sometimes. But we need to, don't provoke your child to wrath. I remember growing up one time that my dad has a temper. You wouldn't know because he's pretty calm right now. And it's because he's aged well. My brother has a temper. And my, I remember one time, it was when I was about 10 years old. I'll never forget this is my brother and my father was having an argument. Now you got to understand, my, bro, my dad does not back down well. So all I seen, I heard, I was, they were in my bedroom, they were fighting. And somehow my brother got a machete. And so they're fighting, and my dad was yelling at my brother, my brother was yelling at my dad, and he grabbed the machete. And my dad looked at him and says, you ain't going to mess with me. But my, my dad kept on stirring the pot. You know, come on. When, when are we going to learn not to stir the pot? There's a point where we just need to calmly and collectively. I like sitting around the table if I can with my kids when, when we're, we're having a disagreement. Number one, there's a barrier between me and them. Amen? When you think about it, there has to be a barrier, especially if it's going to get heated. Amen? If we parents expect honor from our children, we must be honorable before them. We must have to set the example before them. How do we do that? We must discipline them. Woohoo! It's not always fun. Many, many years ago, I went up to my dad. I said, Dad, thank you so much for whipping my hiney. And he looked at me and said, What? Thank you for giving me spankings. Thank you for help me grow up the way I need to go. If we would see that more often, we'd have more uh, young people, more adult young people acting rightly. Amen? There's something that we need to know as parents we must provide for our kids. Not their wants. I told my, I told Abby, Abby goes, I need a new phone. I know you don't need a new phone. You want a new phone. There's, by law, I'm only required to provide certain things for you. I'm providing to give you shelter, clothing, food. That's it. And as a Christian, spiritual upbringing. I'm not, by law, I'm not supposed to, I don't have to provide you a phone. That's a gift. I don't have to provide you to drive my car. That's a gift. In fact, if I wanted to say you ain't driving nothing, you're walking, that's what you're going to have to do. Come on, some of you saints, we used to walk two miles uphill to get to school, and, and you used to make your shoes out of, yeah, and this deep, and you used to make your shoes out of old tires. I know. <laughs> but the fact is, we, we have to understand that we as parents have to provide certain things for them. This day and age, the, the mentality, we owe them something, we don't owe them stuff, anything. We brought them in the world, we can take them out. Amen? Amen? And the kids are going, I ain't giving up my phone for nothing. We usually reap from our children what we sow. You get that? You look at your kids, you go, why are they acting that way? Then if you look at the reflection in the mirror, you're like, oh! I was disciplining my kid one time and I was like making statements like, this is going to hurt you, hurt you more than it hurts me. You know, uh, you better obey what I say, or, you know, I'm like, it happens to you, right? No, 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 you said that back to you. <laughs> and the fact is, we get so caught up in these statements, and I sat back after I said these statements, and said, that sounds just like my dad. Yeah. I heard my dad's voice in my head. Yes. Basically, our kids learn from us. Yes. If, you, if you look at your kids, some of the things they're doing now as adults, you're like, I used to. Just look at the reflection because you taught them that. You trained them in the way they should go. What if your kid's not living for the Lord? Well, you didn't. if you taught them rightly, you cannot um, take that upon yourself. If you raise them in the admission of the Lord and they're not living for the Lord, you just pray for them now. Right? right? Because that's their choice. But you taught them right. So you don't have to look in the mirror for that unless you taught them how to run away from the Lord and then come back. There is a promise in Exodus 20, verse 12, that says that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. 
If you honor your mother and father, you'll, you'll find honor yourself. All right, let's jump into the next. See, I've got good, i got time here. The second of the three to ten commandments I'm going to use today is, Thou shalt not kill. I don't think any of us have killed before. Maybe a, a mouse or something. It shall, you shall, in, in the Amplified it says, you shall not c- commit murder. Unjustified, deliberate homicide. In Matthew 5, 21 to 26, here's what it says. It says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is ang- angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, there remember that you, your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you deliver you to the judgment. And the judge hand you over to the officer and you are thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of, of there till you have paid the, the last penny. So when we talk about where does murder begin, it begins in your heart. Do you understand that? Murder begins here. Someone doesn't run out and say, I'm going to commit murder. It starts here. The word the Bible talks about if you say I hate you, it's it's the same word as though you wish they were dead. If I say I hate this, now I admit to you I'm a murderer of vegetables. Uh-uh. I hate vegetables. I wish they were dead, but I know they're good for me. But I don't like vegetables. Just want to let you know I'm a murderer of vegetables. The philosophy of, of thou shalt not kill comes from Exodus 22.2. And here's what it says. Exodus 22.2. Maybe I have it up there, maybe I don't. Okay, here's what it says. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck at a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. Exodus 21.29 says, an ox gores a man and he dies, his owner also shall be put to death. So you look at both ways, even in this day and age, that if someone breaks into your house, you have the right to defend your home, right? And if they find that what you did was rightly, then you will not be guilty. But if your animal, in the Bible times, if your animal kills somebody, you're at fault. So Henry Sloan, Sloan Coffin said that the responsibility of the owners by, by their stockholders, directors, or managers for accidents, when they know that they have n- neglected proper precautions, is the modern equivalent of that ancient statue. The corporate that is in the eagerness of dividends does not provide safety measures, breaks the first laws in its buildings. Basically what, what this is saying is that if you came to church and I didn't put ice out in the front and you fall and you break something... We're responsible for it. I'll, I'll go to the hospital with you, and I'll make fun of you while you get your leg put back in place. Just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> I would not. Anyways, but the fact is, that has, has happened. When I, when I was, many, many years ago, I was going to see Dixie Stahl. At, she was in Kansas City. I was heading to Kansas City, but they found, I found out that she moved to Topeka. And so I'm driving the church van, and, and I'm, I'm running that way, and it starts sleeting and ice, like, kind of like it was a couple days ago. And I turn this church van around. Do you know that there's not much weight in a church van unless it's, <laughs> it's empty? So I'm cruising back, and I, I couldn't get up towards Topeka because it was too icy. So I turned in the Beto, and I went to Wendy's because I couldn't get in town yet. And I hit an icy spot, and I went down, and I thought I broke my arm. Well, I went to the hospital. Well, that was 
I could have used insurance of the church because it was a work-related accident. I didn't break anything, which was a good thing, but we have to understand that we're responsible. Just if, if someone would get electrocuted in our church because some faulty thing would be responsible. Okay? So in this day and age, what they're talking about is responsibility. The pattern of Christ we see in Matthew 5, 21 to 22, and, and I think you're going to bring that back up. You have heard that it, it was said to those of old, you should not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. So you'll be in danger of judgment. And then Matthew 7, 21 says, for, for from within, out of the heart of a man proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, and murders. Out of the heart. Remember, we're talking about the heart. 1 John 3, 15, whoever, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Ye know that, that no murder has, hath eternal life abiding in him. Matthew seven twelve says this. In everything, do, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of the prophets. Harvey Elementary School was the elementary school that I went to. I, I came in there because I found out my parents talk, told me that I have, I'm part Native American. Mm -hmm. I was excited. Well, a smidgen of Native American. Okay, a drop. Well. And I found out that I was part of the Blackfoot tribe, so I decided that, oh man, that's good stuff. So I decided I, I have the right. I'm a Native American. So this, this principal, this kid that said something to me, so I beat him up. And, 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 and the principal came to me and says, what do you think you're doing? I says, the Bible says, what, whatever you want done to you, you're going to do, you know, you're going to, you know, what this Bible says. It says this, uh, everything, do, do to others as you'd have them do to you, for it sums up the law. Whatever you want done to them, you, you know, you do it, you, whatever. Whatever happens to you, you do it back to them, right? Yeah. That's what I was claiming on. My, my, my principal goes, that's not really what it means. Right. I don't have a right if you sock me in the eye, sock you in the eye. The Bible actually says if someone hits you, offer them the other cheek, cheek as well. That's right. See, we get so caught up in you know, what you do to me, I'm going to do to you. Mm -hmm. The revenge factor. Mm -hmm. We don't need that in our world because we see too much of it already. Amen? Amen. Yes. If you kill my uncle, I'm going to kill you. It doesn't make much sense, does it? So, the path for Christians. We, we hear a lot of controversy about what Christians murder. Should, a, should a, uh, someone go to war? Should, should, you know, let me deal with that again. This is, this is uh, Ote's comments. What about war? It is right for a Christian to take the life of another human being at war. He says, um, those who, who say killing at, in war is justified cite the wars of the Old Testament and point out that the Lord is a man of war. When we have a Christian that goes in the military, I was in the military for 30 days. And, and, yes. You're just, <sighs> but it, I would never have been called to kill somebody. But there are Christians that will say, you should not be in the military because the Bible says thou should not murder. But you have in the Old Testament versions of war. So it really comes down to this. It has to be your own conviction if you are going to do that or not. If you're not going to stand up and go to war, then you should never join the military. Amen? What about capital punishment? We see that... Um, many places. We actually have a kill room at, at uh, the prison that they have never used. Cor corporal punishment is, my thing is, all right, you do this, if you kill somebody, if you're a serial killer, you know what? You should die. If you don't, if I'm too harsh in that, my thing is, you know, you've done this, so we're not being mean to you. Actually, it's the nicest killing ever so um, you know that's my theme on that what about mercy killings we, we've heard a lot about the elderly wanting help assistance in mercy killings I'm not for that 
maybe you are. I don't think it's justified uh, killings. It's it doesn't. Now, if you're if your person's in the hospital and you need there, there's a sign to not res- resuscitate. That's a whole lot different than mercy killings. Okay. Let's deal with the one that shouldn't be a big deal for us is abortion. Abortion is murder. Yes. Yes. We all agree upon that? Yes. The taking of a body, taking of a fetus, is murder. Yes. Is murder. Now the big one that has come up that I've had to be a part of a couple times and seen is suicide. Suicide is the most hardest things to wrap your mind around. I've been on chaplain on call for uh, a couple suicides, which has been very difficult for me to wrap my head around it because it is a person taking their own life some way, and that's really difficult to, because it can go, you know, it's, it's doing harm to one, one body. The, the, the Bible says thou shall not kill means also thou shall not kill thyself. And it's still true that if someone takes their own life, thou shall not kill. Now, some of you may know or have met people or been around people that have participated or even tried to kill themselves. It is very hard when you're, when you're getting ready to do a funeral that this person is this person in heaven or in hell. You know what? It's, it's very difficult because at that moment when that person ingests all the pills or do whatever... You never know what the last breath that they took, what they would have. Right. You're hoping that if they were growing up in a Christian, that they would have cried out to God. So really, at that moment, you don't know, but they have killed themselves. So if you have known somebody that has committed suicide, my heart goes out for you. Because in the last uh, six months, I've had to been on scene for uh, people who have committed suicide. All right, so 1 John um, 1.9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1.9. So at that moment when that person who committed suicide takes that last breath, hopefully that they were able to cry out to God. I'm not judge or jury when someone it, it dies. So, all right, that was pretty deep. Especially the last one, because it hits close to home. The next one is my, uh, my least favorite to deal with, but I, I'm going to deal with it, and I hope you understand my heart on it. Being faithful is honorable. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know this was going to come up because it's one of the big ten. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, Matthew 5, 27 to 32, it says, You have heard that it was said, those of old, we've read this already, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to, to lust for her has already committed adultery with, with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And as your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it, it is more profit for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Deep stuff. So I'm going to pray right now because when we get into this, it can go either way this morning. Lord, we just ask that you bring clarity of thought. That, Lord, in this day and age, there is a lot of thoughts on this subject. A lot of writings, a lot of books, a lot of ideas. Lord, may we submit to you and your ideas to your word, and that's all that matters. May the truth that passes all understanding hit us right where, between the eyes. Lord, we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. So adultery, I have been privileged and honored to, to counsel, to coach, to mentor people that have dealt with the issue of pornography. And, and it's amazing because it's the highest thing that's going on in this world today. 
not only of men, but also of women. Uh, pornography is huge. It is a billion dollar ent entity enterprise in this world. Yeah. There was one time that there was a, a, a denomination that was having a, a big meeting in Florida that actually the, the, me the, the head guy of the hotel went to the head guy of this conference and says, well, I don't understand this. You guys are Christians, right? The guy says, yeah, we're Christians. Then why is it that your conference had the highest pornography movies rented than any other conference I've had in this place? It's really sad where, where we as Christians fall into that kind of stuff. The lust of the eyes, the, the, the lust of the flesh. Well, we have some causes of adultery, physical causes, that, that when, when we, we have a built-in sexual drive, we have things in our life. And, and I'm not justifying, I'm not even saying it's okay, I'm saying that the reason why adultery happens is because someone sees something a little bit better and they're going to go after it. Yeah. They're stupid. When I, when I sat with a, another pastor many, many years ago, and this pastor says, have you ever thought about cheating? This is another pastor telling me, have you ever thought about cheating on your wife? I says, I'm never going to cheat on my wife. I'm, I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the world to me. There is nobody that can even measure up to her. And, and he goes, well, you're going to fall into it. Sometimes I says, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I will yes. never. No longer is this guy ministry. He's selling used cars somewhere else. It's a statement is that person could not restrain themselves from seeing that stuff. Spiritual causes. Well, God must, I must marry the wrong person, so I'm going to step up. There is none of that. The, another spiritual cause is a Christians often become careless and are trapped by Satan at this point. They, 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 they become really casual. I want to let you know that um, I'll never ride with a person of the opposite sex in my car. Unless my wife's with me. Protection. In this day and age, even in a small town, if I ride with one of you, you never know what it's going to say. It's going to your reputation, my reputation. Yeah. I rode with Miss Veneta one time. I thought there, there was no way anyone was going to say anything about it. <laughs> She's like my mama. <laughs> all right? So I didn't worry about that at all. But if I would, if me and Holly would go out, there could be something that's said. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful what we portray. Yeah. When I counsel women, I meet in a public place. I will meet in the library or I'll meet on the front step of my house. I will not be out. Why? Protection. It says to flee any way of appearance of evil. Amen? That means every area, Facebook, whatever, keep it pure. Amen? Yeah. All right. All right. Psychological needs, we won't really get in that too much, but adultery is committed by when you, your, your, your mind is going all different places. Plus, this day and age with TV and stuff, it makes your mind go all different places. Yeah. The consequences of adultery is, it comes up divorce is a big high of committing adultery. But let's, let's talk about this adultery thing. Adultery, according to the Amplified, is do not commit adultery. That's what it says, right? We justify, well, I'm not really married anymore. Day, this day and age is the whole process of shacking up. That's my term. It's not in Wikipedia or anything. Is where we have this idea that I'm going to try out marriage. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm going to live together. I'm going to have all the stuff marriage has but I'm never going to be committed. I, I was praying one time when I was at a conference of a sermon title that was called I Do Eventually, which means I'm going to shack up until and then eventually I might marry you. But when you don't get married, when you're just shacking up, there is really no commitment. There's always an out. And I am pleased that Holly and Vernon is here today. That was one of my favorite weddings to do. <laughs> The fact is, sometimes we get, we justify what is right. Yeah. We look at our day and age and, and really didn't think after Thanksgiving I was going to deal with this. But I think we get so, we compromise. Mm -hmm. 
the, the Nike sign, just do it, is, is really a theme in today's uh, relationships. We shack up, we think it's okay, but really it's not okay. The marital bed is between a man and a woman that are married. Not a man, a woman, and all the other partners. Because what happens is, let's say it's a, it's a female that has multiple partners. Each part of her is given to another partner. And we, we get that and it's so divided. If we re really look at the marital relationship, it should be pure. Now I understand it says that uh, sexual uh, infidelity is, is a reason for divorce. But I also come to believe this also. Is that if, if a person is being abused, they need to get out. Yes. That's my feeling. Mm -hmm. But if you allow infidelity in your home, you get what you get and don't throw a fit. Right. I've had the, I have had the privilege to see many couples get married. Vernon and Holly is one of them. The Knights are another one. I, I get excited about that. Uh, the Browns, Dylan and Jessica, you know, just excited, you know, Amen. because they're committed. That's right. And I love that because if you're just shacking up, there's no commitment at all. I sat down many, many years ago with a couple that they didn't want to admit they were shocking up. But you know, God speaks to my heart in pretty different ways. And so I'll sit to this person and they go, well, we're, we're shocking up because we can't afford to live apart. And I'm like, and then they go, I love this part, but we're not sleeping together. I just went, whatever. Well, we're not, we're not. I'm sleeping on the couch and she's sleeping in the bedroom. The right mood, it all goes south. Yeah. My, my sister said that to my parents. One of her boyfriends was living there. Oh, we're not sleeping together. And all of a sudden, the right mood, she comes home and says, hey, I'm pregnant. We need to put, set a standard. We need to train up our children the way they should go. And, and if we say, it's okay to shack up, then we're only saying... It's okay to keep on living in sin. Because that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Have I offended anyone yet? Let me go a little bit further. No, I'm just kidding. That was one of the hardest things to talk about because in this day and age, everyone says it's okay. Yeah. And, and I just want to tell you that, that according to the word of God, it's not okay. It's not okay. And, I, and I'm so pleased that God is working on people's hearts. But if we think it, we make it okay... Mm -hmm. And we say it's okay. Let me put it a little bit deeper. You cannot be shacked up and still be a Christian. Because where light and darkness, they don't work together. Amen. That's right. And so the fact is, the appropriate thing is to do is stop shacking up, get your heart right with the Lord, and get married. Amen? Amen. All right. That's a heavy subject for me today. I should have dropped this off for the next year. I'm just kidding. Hallelujah. I talked about the something that happens. All of the, our individuals involved, something happens. The home and the marriage relationship are threatened. There is no deepness. There is no commitment. There, if, if we're supposed to uh, do not commit adultery, we're supposed to honor the, the marital bed, that means we stay pure with one another, amen? Yes. That means with the things we looked at, the things we watch, even the movies that we watch, it doesn't even have to be sexual in nature. We should set a standard, amen? Yes. Hallelujah. And then finally, we understand that finally society pays for that, that stuff. I was working at the academy uh, many, many years ago, and this woman comes in and says, well, I'm going to quit uh, the academy. I'm not going to graduate. I'm just going to do whatever I want. I says, really? I says, what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to lay home and take care of my baby, and I'm just going to lay on the couch and watch TV all the, all the time. I went, how do you afford that? I wish I could do that. How do you do that? Oh, don't worry about it. The government's going to pay for it. Wow. And I went, wait a minute. I'm not okay with that. 
I says, because I'm a taxpayer, I'm not okay. I know there's people that need that kind of help, and I'm cool with that, but don't tell me you're going to lay on the couch, watch TV, take care of your baby, and I'm going to provide for you. We need to set a standard. Amen? Yes. It says in the Bible, if you do not work, you do not eat. Amen? Woohoo! But we do pay for it, and I'm, I'm glad to pay. I love when, it, when we see people being helped that need help. Amen? That's why I love doing commodities. That's why I love doing uh, part of God's storehouse. I love seeing the hungry fed. That, that just blesses me. And, and people go, well, you see all that? You see that? They don't need it. They're smoking cigarettes. They're, they're sm talking on a smartphone. No one knows their situation. Amen? How do you conquer adultery? You realize the source of the problem. Matthew 5, 20, whoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Where it starts. You start looking, you start Googling, you start checking out stuff that you have no idea, no part of being. When I was in Panama, uh, one of the leaders go, oh, look at that beefcake. And I went, what? And we were talking about how Guys are always Googling girls. And I looked at it and I says, you are a hypocrite. You're Googling the guys. And then we got a big discussion. If you women would start to dress appropriately, we would be falling into sin. And I looked at the girl and I says, if you'd stop Googling guys, they would stop falling into sin. The fact is we, we need to set a standard. And there's a price to be paid in the conquest is that if you want to conquer adultery, if you want to conquer the addiction of lust, you need to find accountability, mentorship, someone that, um, like I said, right now I'm, I'm going with four different people through mentorship on subjects like as this, and I'm cool with that. You know what? It doesn't mean that they're dirt bags. It means they fall into it, they got cleaned up, and they came to me and they says, I don't know how to do this on my own, can I get some help? And you know what? God's working all out. I wish I could share the whole stories, but I can't. The fact is God is working out in every single one of these individuals. Amen. And I'm excited about it because they have to report back to me every week, and it's so much fun. <laughs> how else do you get it? You think pure thoughts. How do you do that? You, you run from sin. If you're watching a TV program and there's inappropriate stuff on there, you turn it off. If you're, when we were in Panama, Portugal, when I was 11th grade, we would come out of this, this hotel every morning and, and there was this big billboard of this naked woman right outside our hotel. So we'd be on the bus, we'd come around the circle driveway, smack dab was this, this, this built bulletin board with a naked woman. You know what we all did? We looked down at the floor. Because we're going to go into places that we're going to be ministering. If our mind is thinking about the, the girl that's naked on the bulletin board, and we can't minister effectively. The, the, the DCAP, the DYD says, don't be surprised if you're at the pool and some woman takes off all her clothes because they acceptable naked bathing. You know, you do that, you run from that. You don't, you're not around from, around that stuff. Think pure thoughts. Hallelujah. Woo! You just run from it. We, we live in a society that says, run to it. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't kill you, it must not be that bad. If it feels good, do it, no matter what the cost is. Can I tell you, church, if it's against the word of God, don't do it. Amen? Amen? Philippians 4.8 says this. This is what I'm going to leave you with. Finally, brethren, whatsoever true things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of good report, if there be any virtue if there be any praise, think on these things. Let me read that to you again. Finally, brethren, which means all of us, 
Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there are any, by any praise, think on these things. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you 